Okay, I started when I was 11 years old. Uh, my family, it's well documented, but my family are all musicians right through to my great-great-grandmother who was a classical guitar player. My grandfather was a professor of music at the Royal Academy. Um, my other grandfather was a drummer. Um, my father was a piano player. My younger brother is also a drummer still. Uh, my nephew's a drummer. Um, there's quite a few guitar players in the family, so um, I managed to uh, lean towards I say managed, I sort of went the drumming way mainly because of a film which was sent over from America to the UK called The Gene Krupa Story. It was known as Drum Crazy actually in Europe but it was listed as The Gene Krupa Story here in the US. I saw that film, decided that's what I wanted to do and as I say I've walked down that path ever since. Um, I left school when I was 15 and by that time I'd already played in various like bands, a bit like the Lawrence Welk Orchestra. I'd done that for a couple of years because you know I'm quite a good reader, and that was kind of very easy to play and this and that. I wasn't very interested in being in um, in a, an orchestra or a symphonic orchestra, though that's what uh, my parents wanted me to do because it was a regular job with a pension and all that stuff. I, I really wanted to look further afield, and I got invited to play with a band called the King Bees when I was about 14 and they were like a rock and roll rhythm and blues type of band. I joined them and obviously I never never looked back. On doing that I got spotted by um, a chap called Chris Farlow who had a number one single in the UK called Out of Time. This was written by Keith Richards and Mick Jagger. So um, he noted um, my playing and said, if you're ever short of work or you'd like to come down to London, because I'm from Birmingham originally, so I'd have to travel 120 miles south. He said, uh, you know, there would be a job for you uh, in a band with me. And as I say, this chap had already had a number one single, so he was quite big cheese at the time. Anyway, when the King Bees finished, um, it was about a week before I left school. I left school on the Friday, left home on the Sunday, did the audition in the Bag of Nails on the Wednesday and joined Chris Farlow and the Thunderbirds and stayed with him till I was about 17, 17 and a half, during which period I then made a move into, I played a few sessions for people, I've uh, not really been a hired gun ever, I've only ever played for a percentage with anyone, I don't play for wages and I decided to do some sessions because my father at the time said look you're a good reader why don't you just go in and pick up some extra work so one of the things that I picked up was playing in a band called the crazy world and the crazy world were actually attached to Arthur Brown uh, the crazy world of Arthur Brown anyway I played with them and before you know it um, I was in the band and we had a single which was number one album which was number one at the same time 1968 here in America and that was the first time uh, I came to the US and of course America has been um, the mecca of my career I'm still very grateful for everything that it's done for me. Uh, from the crazy world of Arthur Brown I formed my first band called Atomic Rooster which was basically quite big in Europe, underground band, prog rock was happening then and um, during that period um, I recorded a single called Tomorrow Night. Tomorrow Night got to number one but what happened was during that period I was recording the single um, I got a call from uh, Greg and Keith if they, they were after a drummer I didn't really know too much about Greg Lake I knew Keith Emerson so I decided to go along and see what they were all about anyway um, an offer was made that I couldn't refuse so they had to the Atomic Rooster had to re-record tomorrow night um, with their new drummer I had then sat in rehearsals with Greg Lake and Keith Emerson for about six months meanwhile the Atomic Rooster was number one so you can imagine I felt quite uh, I might have made a big mistake here so I went on and um, played with the uh, ELP right up to the end of 78. We sold about 35, 40 million records, registered. Uh, and then the band broke up and I had about two years off where I kind of built a house and did this and that. And I joined the uh, band called Asia. John Wetton, Steve Howe, Jeff Downs and myself. And that was the beginning of MTV, that complete age where this was all new. And we were signed by Geffen Records. The rest is history really. We had a number one single album for seven weeks. That was in the heat of the moment. Um, second album did pretty good. Third album not so good. And it was a downhill from there. And uh, that went right the way through to the end of the 80s when we reformed ELP. Took it right up to from 91 through to 98, which was a nice reformation, nice period. 
Um, obviously we did not um, manage to um, have as much success the second time around as Evanston Lake and Palmer, but it was still um, well worth doing. We made some good records, Black Moon and things like that. Um, in the Hot Seat was another album we made, so I was very happy with what went down. Um, then that we decided to finish that off and after ELP I then thought well now it'd be time for me to have my own band which uh, I did and I think in 2001 I formed uh, Carl Palmer's ELP Legacy which is basically a power trio no keyboards two guitars and we play a lot of prog rock music as far as Emerson Lake and Palmer is concerned uh, original pieces such as Tarkas, Knife Edge, things like this and obviously a lot of classical adaptations like ELP did pictures at a, an exhibition and I still have my band today I'll be back in America in, um, in May I've already done a tour of America with um, CPL as I call it, Carl Palmer Legacy um, we're coming back as I say in November we'll play I think about 16 dates it's over like a three to four week period I've got a few art ventures that I'm uh, going to sort of dive into when I say ventures I mean uh, I actually um, produce this artwork through using LED drumsticks and I um, capture it on film it's put into a computer and we, we try to modify it or do what we've got to do um, basically produce pieces of art which we were selling here today uh, we did donate X amount of money to charity and have been doing ever since I started doing that um, so that's what's going on up to date during that whole period Asia did reform and Asia reformed I think in 2007 and Asia has been together and I've been in the two bands right up um, to this year playing this year we we cancelled because we had a few health problems within the group um, but I would think that Asia will be back on the boards I would have thought by probably this time next year but um, I just have to wait and see I don't want to talk too much about the problems we had there but um, the basically health problems they weren't disputes and um, I will I'll just carry on with with my band like I've been doing um, I'm already sort of playing through to June next year so I'm, I'm averaging between 80 90 concerts a year one of the things that many musicians wanted to do in the 70s, which probably sounds very strange today, um, it wasn't as expensive then to, to rent as a venue, because obviously you have to pay quite a lot of money to the unions and whatever, but uh, uh, to get to Madison Square Gardens kind of meant that you'd made it. And I um, managed to get to, uh, to Madison Square Gardens with Emerson Lake and Palmer, early 70s, it would have been two nights. And um, I always think of Madison Square Gardens as not the fact it's uh, such an important venue, such an important, you know, um, lifting stone in your career, as it were. You know, this is uh, obviously a great, great place to play. But uh, it was the beginning of um, a lifelong relationship that I had with Ludwig Drums. I recall turning up at uh, Madison Square Gardens without a drum set, which is something you shouldn't do, by the way. Um, but I had all these brown boxes piled up in my dressing room and it was a brand new Ludwig drum set which I took out of the boxes that day and played and here I am playing my favourite drums in my the most prestigious venue I'd played to date so I always think of uh, Madison Square Gardens as Emerson Lake and Palmer and Ludwig drums. Cool, cool. Um, and just uh, influences? Uh... Um, my influences really are quite broad you know I mean I could be influenced by the local drummer playing in a bar at the end of the street you know if you stay there long enough he's going to play something that's good everyone can play one thing that's good but I've had many many influences whether it be from the original American jazz drummers such as Joe Morello, Elvin Jones, uh, Buddy Rich I've had just so many the very first person that influenced me as I said earlier was the was Gene Krupa the Gene Krupa story so my influences have really been more American American than European but there have been some great uh, uh, English players and one of the guys that helped me on my way to getting a good uh, education I've had about five drum teachers in my life uh, there was a guy called Kenny Clare who was one of England's or probably still is England's greatest a living big band big band drummer and he helped me get um, a teacher who was absolutely fantastic but funny enough the teacher that I had lived in London and was an American so <laughs> it's always been to the American side so that's how it went for me on an educational influence side I think they're all kind of precious when you know when you're creating them and I think then they leave the nest and they take on a life of their own and all they do is um, they form a soundtrack of your life and uh, I hear a song or hear something that I've recorded and go oh I know where I was then and, and that's what it's all about so they're all different and they're all in Incredibly important. Yeah.
I think uh, Arena Rock, Stadium Rock in America, obviously is of the highest level when it's done properly and proficiently with the right equipment, the right people mixing, the right sort of, um, I mean you have to understand today, 2015, 16, you know, the, the PAs and the boards and the actual digital sort of desks that we have are far superior than, you know, when you had sort of the Beatles playing at Candlestick Park or, or whatever it was. So today you can actually manufacture a sound on stage which is equal to the studio and I'm sure that a lot of musicians would agree with me that there's no reason today not to be able to produce to be able to produce fantastic concerts night after night it's really just down to the humans being able to produce a certain standard which you know will be uh, welcoming and will be right but the actual sound sonic quality will always be incredibly high because the equipment is so sophisticated and I'd probably say the most important um, gig of my lifetime would have been the Isle of Wight we were playing at the Isle of Wight festival we were a last minute call it was only the second gig we ever did we were completely unknown we played in Plymouth Guildhall and then the following day we were asked to play at the Isle of Wight which is two days later uh, we had a 45 minute slot and we played pictures at an exhibition it was a fantastic day we flew in by helicopter we played and we flew out I think on that particular bill Jimi Hendrix um, I think there's Janis Joplin was at the doors uh, the who were definitely there I didn't meet any of them at the time we flew in uh, played the date and we flew out we flew out we flew in as a band completely unknown and as we got on that helicopter and we left we were known internationally around the world